All right, uh, welcome everybody. My name is Gregor. Um, the, the president of the local platypus chapter here at UIC. Um, apologies for the delay. Um, our originally scheduled third speaker, Fred Mecklenburg with News and Committees, uh, News and Letters, uh, hasn't sent us a sign that he's going to attend, so. Uh, I, I can speak for him. He's planning to attend. He doesn't, he's a lot of ideas about cell phones. Oh. So he could just be late. I know I talked to 10 people to find down Paul. Okay. So, <laughs> can you do it spontaneously? Do you want us to talk spontaneously about socialism? No, no, no. I, I'm just explaining what's happening with him. No, oh, no, okay. I thought, you, I thought that I heard you said. I, he's my boyfriend. <laughs> I thought you, you said I can I can do it. So, uh, but we actually very spontaneously two minutes ago just won a third speaker, um, who's uh, David, who's going to self introduce uh, in a minute because I don't actually have a bio. Um, so. Uh, if you guys want to find out more about the Platypus Society, our activities here on campus, um, we uh, host a reading group every Thursday at 5 at Argo T in Student Center East. It's an introduction to uh, Marxism. Um, if you want to find out more, um, you know, sign up over there um, to get um, week weekly updates. We also have coffee breaks every Tuesday at, now I get mixed up, 2 p.m., also at Argo T. Um, the coffee breaks are sort of a casual get together where we just digest the politics of the week. Uh, maybe talk a little bit more about what we published in the Platypus Review or um, about what, what happened in the. Uh, right? Uh oh. Right? <laughs> uh oh. So that's fine. Can I purchase? <laughs> please, please. Um, do you want to have me a chair? Uh, please come over. I don't want to. You still want to speak? Actually, it would be cool to have a four panel, four speaker panel. Um, all right, so we're actually more than complete now. We have four speakers now. We're still gonna do 12, 12 minutes. Uh, so yeah, all right, that threw me off, but. Um, so yeah, if you wanna find out more about our activities here, we're an educational project. Um, we published the monthly platypus review, which you can pick up for free over there. Um, if you wanna continue the conversation after the, after the event, we're planning on uh, going out together to a Spectrum Bar and Grill, which is just around the corner here in Greektown on Halstead and Jackson. Um, so, you know, don't feel shy, come join us. Um, is that open to people under 21? I think so. I don't think we were carded last time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that I can say. Um, so, John, do you want to speak very last now? Because I said. We, we can. You know what, let's just go left or right. Okay, okay, cool. So the format is going to be the following. Uh, uh, the speakers are going to hold 12-minute uh, opening remarks in reaction to a prompt that we sent them ahead of time. I'm going to read it in a minute. Um, upon which uh, I might take the privilege of asking the first question to digest the panel and, and send sort of some of the initial thoughts I got back uh, to the speakers before we open the floor to you guys. Um, um, so we're just going to go from left to right. Uh, first speaker, um, or on your far right, is going to be John Bachtel, who's the national chair of the Communist Party USA. He was elected chair in 2014 um, after serving as chair of the Communist Party of Illinois from 2001 to 2014, and Communist Party of New York um, 1992 till 2001. He was national coordinator of the Young Communist League from. Uh, 1985 to 1992. He has been active in many electoral campaigns, including both Obama presidential campaigns and his U.S. Senate campaigns, uh, as well as the Sanders and Clinton campaigns, Chewy Garcia for mayor, many aldermanic and state legislative campaigns, in addition to being a candidate for the New York District um, School Board in the Bronx. He served two terms on the local school council at his children's elementary school. He's been active in Chicago Jobs with Justice and currently in Lincoln Square Indivisible, and he writes frequently for People's World and Current Politics and Marxist Strategy and Tactics. Se second speaker is going to self-introduce. Yes, I'm uh, David Faze. Uh, I'm a Platypus member, and I recently graduated from the London School of Economics, where I studied sociology. Okay, great. Then third speaker is going to be John Abbott. Um, coming of age in the late 1960s, John became politically active as a high school student in small town southern Illinois. After two years in college, he dropped out to take on full-time political activism in Detroit. He worked in that city's auto plants for 11 years before moving to Chicago, where after some years, he resumed his college edu education. He has gained his bachelor's, master's, and PhD in history at UIC. His dissertation focused on peasant politics in rural Bavaria during the 19th and 20th centuries. 
that research project generously subside, uh, subsidized, was generally subsidized through a Fulbright program in 1993, generated a number of published articles in a, an as yet unfinished book project about peasant culture, Catholicism, and politics in rural Germany. Uh, John taught at several Chicago area universities until coming to UIC in 2010. Here, as senior, senior, lecturers, senior lecturer, he teaches a wide range of politics and modern European history, for which he has won several teaching awards. And then our last speaker is going to be Fred. Uh, uh, Fred is a member of the, Fred Mecklenburg is a member of the National Editorial Board of News and Letters. Um, I guess the, the, their uh, publications as well as the Communist Party's publications are also available over there. He became an activist in the wake of the upheavals of 1989 and a Marxist humanist in recognition of their contradictions. He has never held a white collar job. He edited and introduced Crossroads of History, Raya Dunayevskaya's writings on the Middle East, and his own writings in support of the Syrian Revolution will be published soon. So the speakers are going to respond to the following prompt. I'm going to uh, snap my finger if you guys have a roughly uh, 90 seconds left. Does, does that sound good? Um, just like a one time. Hope it doesn't throw you off. So the, they uh, are going to respond to the following prompt, which is pretty straightforward. This, the term socialism appears to be enjoying a resurgence of public interest, both favorably where it is self-prescribed and pejoratively where it is meant to degrade the respectability of public figures. From early 2016, at the height of Bernie Sanders' campaign for the Democratic Party nomination, to Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez's victory over Joe Crowley in June, in a Democratic primary in the Bronx, the term socialism appears to be gaining some level of purchase and a whole lot of press. In many instances, socialism is commingled with terms as varied as social, democratic, communist, Marxist, anarchist, etc. As such, we view this as an opportune moment to ask, what is socialism, after all? What do public figures mean when they identify as socialists or any one of its varied strains? What do their opponents think it means? What does it mean and what can it mean? Perhaps most important of all, what did it mean in the past? Pretty easy to do in 12 minutes, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so with that, uh, John. Okay, well, I don't know if I'll touch on all of this, but um, anyway, it's great to be here tonight. And thanks to the Platypus Society for the invitation uh, to participate in this panel and discussion. Uh, discussing socialism, it's always uh, uh, an interesting, exciting uh, topic, especially now. Um, you know, according to that recent Gallup poll, I don't know if you saw that, that 57% of Democrats uh, have a positive attitude towards socialism and 47% of Democrats have a negative attitude toward capitalism. Uh, and this uh, had reached a peak in, already in 2010. And so the Sanders campaign, you know, kind of gave voice to what was already existing, that sentiment that was already existing. The crises of capitalism, of wealth extreme, of climate change, university debt, health care, racial and gender inequity, and democracy are driving the shift in attitudes. I think most people define socialism as a society with greater income and social equality greater democracy and freedom from racism, sexism, and anti-LGBTQ and disability discrimination. They see an expanded uh, public sector providing universal health care and education, like the, much like the Scandinavian countries. Of course, those countries are not socialist. They are capitalist economies with a large public welfare sector. Most people equate, at least in my mind, most people equate communism with totalitarianism. Their image of communism is shaped by the experiences of the Soviet Union, Eastern Bloc countries, China, Cuba, and Vietnam, to name a few. Socialism first developed in those places under the very worst of conditions, under development, world war, civil war, counter-revolution. Democratic socialism is impossible almost impossible to build under such circumstances. Capitalism is characterized by private ownership of the means of production, private appropriation of wealth, socially produced through the exploitation of the working class, and the domination of government, politics, and culture by the capitalist ruling class. The construction of socialism begins with the working class and its allies winning political power and commencing to change production and social relations. 
the means of production become socially owned and democratically managed by the working class, which also democratically manages the distribution of the collectively created wealth. Because people are people and production relations, social habits, and, pr and practices don't change overnight, socialism is essentially a transitional phase, at least that's the way I look at it, a process to a self-governing, egalitarian, classless society, which you could also call communism. If the last hundred years of socialist experiments have taught us anything, it is that this process takes a long, long time. And there are no models, either for achieving political power by the working class and its allies or socialist construction. Each country has a unique path based on its own realities, history, traditions, and level of economic and social development. The American people, in their majority, will create a modern 21st century socialism through the daily class and democratic struggles, including those that are raging today, including the trying to defeat you know, Kavanaugh, the Kavanaugh nomination. And based on our own multiracial, multicultural, working class history and traditions of mass democratic struggles. I believe that the path to socialism will also be determined by the needs the need to address existential threats to humanity and nature and resolving sharpening crises, for example, the climate change, the nuclear danger, wealth and social inequality, and economic disrupt disruption brought on by technological change. I think that socialism can be achieved, cannot be achieved without economic and political democracy, addressing racial and gender inequity, and sustainability and harmonizing society with nature. Capitalism can only exist through infinite economic expansion, which clashes with the Earth's finite resources and ability to absorb ecological destruction. For example, the, climate, the effects of climate change will worsen and persist for centuries even if and when the world adopts sustainability. If, you know, even if it was today, it would still, these problems would still persist for a long time to come in the future. It's estimated that five billion people are going to live in a radically different environment by the year 2050. And if you consider this, The entire coastline of the United States is threatened with climate-induced sea level rise. In a worst-case scenario, Florida will be entirely underwater, along with the major metropolitan areas on both coasts. The hills of San Francisco will be a group of islands. Even if 100% of carbon neutral, neutral development is achieved, Miami, New Orleans, Houston, Alaskan native villages, and other communities will be chronically flooded. And this is happening now. It's not something that's off in the future, but it's actually happening now. Millions are and will be forced to flee their homes. The entire world is experiencing similar disastrous consequences. This planetary emergency calls for both sustainable development and societal adaptation to the effects of climate change. And this will take the collective action and resources of humanity and confronting the capitalist system, its profit motive, its, re its production relations, the anarchy of production and development. Human survival will require a different kind of government and a vastly expanded role to carry out these changes. Plan development, including steps to address environmental racism, the deep encroachment on capitalist property rights and profits, public protection and management of natural resources, and reallocation of social wealth. To me, this forms the basis for the transition to democratic eco-socialism in the United States. 
And of course, no one knows the price tag for this transition, including solidarity with the poorest and most vulnerable nations around the world. But it really doesn't matter if humanity is to survive. The transition to clean energy, a demilitarized economy, a Medicare for all health system, and the next wave of automation dri driven by robotics and artificial intelligence will create massive employment disruption. However, transitioning to sustainability, ecological restoration and climate change ad adaptation will also create millions of jobs. Trillions of dollars of infrastructure upgrades are urgently necessary. But the current infrastructure can't simply be replaced. It must be made adaptable to the new climate realities. Well, who will pay for this massive economic, technological, and social transition, including the need for free education, technical, and vocational training, and a guaranteed wage uh, between jobs, either the people or the 1%? Wealth concentration has reached a crisis of extremes. The world's eight richest oligarchs own wealth equal to the poorest half of the world's population. This crisis can only be resolved through massive wealth redistribution and reallocation of federal expenditures. The largest, largest expenditure is the $824 billion military budget, not including the $1.2 trillion nuclear modernization. Demilitarization will also fund adaptation and the transition to sustainability. The extreme right that's embodied in the Republican Party and, of course, Trump administration are backed by the fossil fuel industry, the military industrial complex, and an assortment of billionaire patrons. This represents the main obstacle to embarking on this path of development. We are at a historic juncture at this moment in time, a defining moment for our country, a political crossroads. Defeating the Republican Party in the 2018 elections and ousting them from uh, majorities in uh, Congress and state houses all across the country, and of course ousting Trump in the 2020 elections and eventually electing a left-center governing coalition in its place, a modern-day Roosevelt administration, is an essential first step to laying the basis for advanced democratic reforms in an alternative path of development that includes gradually curbing the, and erasing the power of capital, wresting the power of capital from degree, with degrees Without ousting the right from power, all talk of socialism is just that, talk. Today's growing activism is very exciting, including the thousands of people that were marching all across the country today, opposing the Kavanaugh nomination. Thousands of activists are marching one day and running for office the next and winning. City councils, state legislatures, and Congress will be different with their fighting presence and new space will open for new struggles, including Ocasio-Cortez and others. I'll end by quoting Michelle Alexander, who has a had a debut column the other day in the uh, New York Times, and her vision for this historic process. She said, quote, every leap forward for American democracy, from slavery's abolition to women's suffrage to minimum wage laws to Civil Rights Act to gay marriage has been traceable to that revolutionary river, not the resistance. In fact, the whole of American history can be described as a struggle between those who truly embraced the revolutionary idea of freedom, equality, and justice for all, and those who resisted it. So here's to, the, here's to that, that thought and to, to that revolutionary river that's coursing through our country and, and hopefully will help carry us to uh, a society of equality for all. So thank you. Well, I'm just going to set a timer as well. 
Um, so this was actually an article that I had written for, uh, sorry, this was actually an article that I had written for my school's newspaper. Um, and it was about the uh, centenary of, of 1917 in 2017. Um, and so it's, you know, it's a bit outdated in some respects. In other respects, 2018 is also the century, it's been a century since the failure of the German Revolution. Um, and so some of the remarks that I had written um, still have some salience in considering the question what is socialism today. Um, I wanted to start with some epigraphs to the article. Um, the only historian capable of fanning the spark of hope in the past is the one who firmly is convinced that even the dead will not be safe from the enemy, even if, uh, if he is victorious. And this enemy has never ceased to be victorious. Um, that's Walter Benjamin uh, from Theses on the Philosophy of History. Um, and the second epigraph I wanted to read is uh, by Theodore Adorno to Herbert Marcuse. And he said, there are moments in which theory is pushed forward by practice, but such a situation neither exists objectively today, nor does the barren and brutal practicism that confronts us here have the slightest thing to do with theory anyhow, uh, which I think has salience in considering this question of um, what are the possibilities for emancipatory politics today. Um, so I'll just begin now with the full remarks. A false reassurance exists around the year uh, 1917 equally for those who treat its legacy as a model and those who treat it as a question that has yet to be answered. As the revolutionary Marxist Rosa Luxemburg herself put it, the October Revolution posed a question that could not be answered in Russia. While a centenary is arbitrary, we are compelled nevertheless to reckon with the legacy of 1917 and 1918 this year. It still seems to task us today, but in what way? As one brushes the past century against the grain, it seems that the Marxism of those who attempted to carry out the international proletarian socialist revolution does not explain the world we live in today. Marxism was understood by them as a theory of social revolution, grasped in practice as a living totality. Their imagination of the past, which flashed up like a memory, informing their attempt to transform society, was that of Marx's understanding of the failed democratic revolutions of 1848, wherein the bourgeoisie was no longer able to lead the masses and the proletariat was not yet ready. Instead, bourgeois fanatics for order were shot down, in the or shot down from balconies in the name of order. The state, acting as special bodies of armed men and embodied in the figure of Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, rose above society to act in the interest of everyone and no one in the name of order. For Marx and Marxists, the lessons to be learned from this failure was the necessity of the proletariat to lead the democratic revolution and establish its own political rule as a precondition for the social revolution. The task of proletarian socialists in the late 19th century was thus to create the precondition for this precondition, to build up the International Political Party for Socialism, to build the Socialist International. Thus, radicals like uh, Rosa Luxemburg, uh, Vladimir Lenin, and Leon Trotsky presuppose a circumstance which is absent today, namely the existence of Marxism as a politically organized mass international movement which had begun to lead society. The leading party of the international, the Social Democratic Party of Germany, the SPD, by 1907 had over half a million members, two million members in its affiliated trade unions, and in the federal election had gained 3,259,000 3, votes with 43 seats in the Reichstag. By 1912, the party had grown and with, uh, with uh, basically 4.2 million votes gained uh, and 110 seats, becoming the largest party, and as it grew, it became increasingly involved in the affairs of governing. It was for this reason that a gradual reform of capitalism into socialism seemed plausible to the economists, revisionists, and reformists of the international. Along these terms, the SPD continued to vote for socialist resolutions and carry out mass anti-war agitation up until the very moment in 1914 when the SPD voted for war credits, supporting, if not leading, the imperialist war, thereby betraying their own socialist principles despite having a majority in government. Lenin and Luxembourg saw the rise of this kind of opportunism, which they defined as the liquidation of the lessons of Marxism, the lessons of 1848, as a historically necessary symptom of the success of Marxism in building its political party. Luxembourg warned in 1915 that socialism will be lost only if the international proletariat, well, proletariat fails to measure the depth of, it, of this fall, if it refuses to learn from it. 
Lenin recognized the lessons to be learned from this split within Marxism between the socialist chauvinists who had supported the war and the socialist radicals uh, was that an international proletarian revolution uh, was not only desirable but eminently possible. Uh, Lenin's own politics were concerned with the, this crisis within Marxism. The immediate task on the eve of the Russian Revolution for Lenin was to critique and clarify what it meant to be a Marxist with respect to the emerging political tasks in the revolution. In 1915, Lenin critiqued Plekhanov, the founder of Russian social democracy, for misrepresenting Marx's idea of the regression of the democratic revolution in 1848 from Marx's pamphlet, The Class Struggles in France. Plekhanov argued that the next revolution, after the failure of the Ru Russian Revolution in 1905, ought to have an ascending line of increasingly democratic phases. Lenin, by contrast, upheld that the regression of the democratic revolution in 1905 manifested the, des the desirability and possibility of the proletariat to lead the democratic revolution beyond itself. Uh, in, 1917, in, the, in the 1917 pamphlet, uh, The Dual Power, uh, Lenin dealt with both the Soviets and the provisional government as bourgeois democratic forms that emerged from the revolution of February with a prehistory in 1905. Following February, Soviets had appeared to take on a new form comparable to the Paris Commune of 1871, and that they were a direct seizure by the masses, they replaced the police and the army with the direct arming of the whole people, and replaced the official bureaucracy with a special working arm of service. For Lenin, this expressed an attempt of the proletariat to lead the masses in the revolution. The fact that the provisional government politically relied on this aspect of Soviet power indeed posed the question point blank. Should the provisional government be overthrown immediately? Otherwise, the Soviet's potential would be liquidated and led by Bonaparte, such as Kerensky or Kornilov. <clears throat> Again, in his pamphlet, Can the Bolsheviks Retain State Power? Lenin argued the defeat of the Kornilov coup by the Soviets had made clear that the proletarian leadership of the revolution was not simply desirable, but possible and necessary. It was not premature, as Lenin's opponents suggested, leading to a Blanquist coup or a one-party dictatorship, but rather it was taking responsibility for leading society. Lenin recognized the Soviets could have taken responsibility for transforming society by laying hold of the apparatus capitalism had already created in the shape of the banks, syndicates, postal service, consumer societies, and office employees' unions. The workers could have led the mediation of the social discontents with this apparatus, thus replacing the state bureaucracy uh, with the capitalist bureaucracy led by uh, the, politically the political legitimacy of the workers. Lenin argued while the bourgeois state already forcibly manages social discontents, for instance, by the forcible eviction of a flat, the proletariat's arm of service, consisting of multiple parties and tendencies, could use its political authority to ask property owners out of civic duty to make room for other tenants in need of housing. Um, it, was it was in response to this imminent task, the implementation of the international dictatorship of the proletariat on the basis of a newly emerging potential Soviet government, that provided the ground for Lenin's polemic with the founder of German social democracy, Karl Kautsky. Both Lenin and Kautsky were making arguments for the dictatorship of the proletariat, but they disagreed in their judgment about the concrete role of the Soviets in the revolution. Kautsky argued that the issue of dictatorship ought to be preceded by the proletariat winning over a democratic majority of the Russian people through the Constituent Assembly, while Lenin argued that while it was true the Constituent Assembly had to answer to the people of Russia, the Soviets, by contrast, had to answer to the workers of the world, for example, by providing leadership to the German Revolution. The point for Lenin was that the proletariat doesn't need a democratic majority of a people of a nation. It needs to consciously lead in the transformation of society that is already taking place and is otherwise constituted unconsciously by the international proletariat <coughs> under capitalism. Kautsky doubted Luxembourg's and Lenin's judgment that a world revolution was on the cards in 1917. He thought they had gone mad and lost touch with reality. On the other hand, Lenin argued that it was precisely Kautsky who was obfuscating reality. Retrospectively, after the failure of the German Revolution, in which the leaders of the Spartacus uprising, Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, were assassinated by the SPD, it may even appear that Kautsky was right. Perhaps it was too early. In the crisis of Marxism, on which the revolutionary situation deepened, the meaning of reality was at stake. This affects us today. If Marxists had sought to understand the world not as it is, but as it could and should be, that is critically how it could change, then the absence of any attempt to change the world in the present is problematic for our ability to understand the world even as uh, quote-unquote Marxists. Uh, in the face of the defeat of the international revolution, uh, Marxism learned to avoid reality, giving way to what Walter Benjamin called faith in progress in an eternal defensive fight against the right. 
Marxism itself has continued to liquidate Marxism, even the dead are not safe. In our present historical moment, capitalism is politically transforming itself once again in response to the crisis of neoliberalism. Uh, the leadership out of this crisis has not been manifested in the phenomena such as Syriza, Occupy Wall Street, the Arab Spring, and anti-austerity protests more generally, um, or more generally, uh, Bernie Sanders' candidacy and Jeremy Corbyn's labor leadership, but rather it's been led by the avowed right through UKIP, Brexit, the UK Conservatives' return to rhetorism, and Donald Trump's election. The left has proven to be the last defenders of neoliberalism. Um, I guess, you know, I would say I, some of these remarks were written for the UK context, but they apply here. Um, I said, you know, Corbyn is not a Kerensky. If he gets elected, uh, there won't be a coup to get him out of government. Um, and let alone, he's not a comparable to Lenin either. But the same could be said for whatever leadership is going to rise up for the Democratic Party here. And I also wrote that momentum uh, is not building the special bodies of armed men capable of replacing the bourgeois state. Um, <laughs> and that could also be said of the DSA. <laughs> um, you know, in the policies in the Labor Party manifesto or whatever democratic uh, national agenda there will be in 2020 are not reforms which seek to educate the masses about uh, the self-contradictory nature of their demands through political optic lessons. Um, so there is no international mass socialist party through which the subject for social change could navigate these lessons and lead the crisis society beyond itself. Um, anyways, yeah, I guess I, I'll finish with that. My time, I, I'm getting the, I'm getting the. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, well it's cool. I'll, I'll let it go. Thanks, guys. <laughs> okay, um, well. In 2016, I imagine all of us had much of this experience. Uh, we were engaged in discussions with one or another person, and that person would point out that, after all, Adolf Hitler was a national socialist, and isn't Bernie Sanders a socialist, and therefore isn't Bernie Sanders and his followers the worst Nazis around, right? And how dare you accuse the right of any fascist inclinations or leanings? And that's the kind of pseudo-profundity that will get you a slot on Fox News, but will get you lapped out of order in most other places of the world, the civilized world, where socialism is rather solidly embedded in the political culture, right, is a, usually a fairly respectable option or alternative. Um, and in those situations, the question is, what kind of socialist are you, right? And I make that my introduction because it seems to me the subtext of this gathering is what kind of socialist do we want to be, right? What is this emerging socialism of the U.S. to look like? Um, I would emphasize that socialism was always a plural tradition. It existed long before Marx. It will exist long after those of us in this room are dead and gone. Wherever people are abused in the majority by a capitalist minority, wherever human dignity is assailed, there will arise a culture of critique and opposition and resistance. And somehow, in some way, people will latch themselves onto vaguely defined socialist ideals. That, if I have any item of faith, that draw, article of faith that lies on that. Um, but let's go back to this earlier socialism prior to Marx. Uh, these early socialist thinkers, right, 1820s, 1830s, there's already sort of a critical mass of capitalist development that's giving rise to an oppositional culture. These people are often referred to as the utopian socialists. People usually think in, in association with that with luminaries such as Robert Owen or Charles Fourier or Saint-Simon. But I think what's most interesting and distinctive about this early socialism is not the big three, right, who presumably loom over all these affairs. It's the culture itself, which is vibrant and vital and inclusive. And it's not incidental that a number of women find their mark within this early socialist culture and advance both feminist as well as socialist critiques of the prevailing order, right? Flora Tristian, uh, uh, Suzanne Foucault, and others. And so again, I'm going to emphasize the plurality and the sort of diversity represented by this earlier cultural field of critique, opposition, and resistance. And it's useful to bear that in mind to try to retrieve that earlier story because at a certain point, Marx and Engels come to dominate the story. And at a certain point, at least in our historical understanding, they come to basically um, 
dominate the franchise, so you so to speak, right, of international socialist opinion. And I'm not sure that's altogether a good thing. Um, and we can get more into that later in this conversation. I have an, any number of questions or issues I would raise with Mr. Marx regarding questions such as the dictatorship of the proletariat, the idealization of the proletariat itself. Um, but let's just start with the question of morality. Again, Marx and Engels, as they arrive on the scene, sort of making their political splash in the aftermath of the failed revolutions of 1848, are great pains to distinguish themselves from their predecessors, their utopian predecessors, as they dub them. And they largely do so on the basis of the following. The earlier socialists had predicated their arguments based upon morality, moral appeals to justice. And Marx and Engels, as a matter of pride and principle, dispense with the discourse of morality, dispense with the discourse of justice, and instead emphasize that their socialism was scientific, right? That is to say, it was grounded in a materialist understanding of the laws of history, and it was the very laws of history they proclaimed that would ensure the ultimate triumph of socialism, right? And I think this is rather problematic. On the one hand, this speaks to the great appeal political appeal that Marxism ultimately come, is going to come to exercise because it seems to promise hope, right, in a hopeless time of an inevitable historical triumph, again, conjured up by the very forces of history themselves. And on the other hand, the suspension of moral agency seems to be rather problematic. Amongst other things, it led to a certain self-deception, I think, on Marx's part himself. Even as he scrupulously avoids moral judgment in his discussion of capitalism, his vocabulary is studded with terms such as exploitation, robbery, and hypocrisy, right? I mean, you don't have to read much in Marx to get the sense that this is a man brimming with moral indignation and outrage at the abuses of his times, and yet he cannot acknowledge that. And he can't acknowledge that moral agency plays a role in human affairs. That to him is sort of part of the camouflage, right, or, or, or sort of, um, um, right, a delusion or illusion that bourgeois society imposes upon our thinking. So we have to reject morality as a category, right? Everything is class-based, everything derives from material society. Now this would all be sort of a minor matter, it seems to me, if all we were talking about was Marx. But Marx's followers, and particularly when we get to the 20th century, when we talk about Lenin and Stalin and Mao, also made a point of rejecting morality as a category. That there was no such thing as universal morality. Lenin particularly bitterly contests, right, and disposes of such an idea. And this becomes a rather self-serving formula for increasingly immoral regimes which do violate many moral norms, and their track record has become, it seems to me, part of the problem that current day socialists have to contend with. Because it does seem to me that there is a specter that's haunting this room, and that is the legacy of Marxism-Leninism and the dictatorships of the 20th century. And whenever socialism gets discussed very much, that legacy, that tradition, comes into play. And what is our stance towards it? I feel absolutely no responsibility to defend any of it. I see absolutely no re need to treat Marx or Lenin or any of the rest of them as infallible fonts of wisdom, right, or wise guidance. Marx himself, in 1852, in his 18th Brumaire, talks about the proclivity of historical actors to wrap themselves in the costumes of those before him before them, right? He talks about the revolutions of 1848 wrapping themselves up in the costume of Robespierre and the others from the French Revolution so many years before. And he says, this is time for us to put aside this childishness. Let the dead bury the dead. Let the past expire in its own terms. The social revolution of the present must draw its poetry from the future, not the past. And yet here we are in the early 21st century, and we're, try, we're talking about this very interesting juncture in American political life where socialism is sort of coming back around again, and yet the discussion seems to be haunted and basically contained by all of this replay of what Lenin did and what he didn't do, or what, so Lenin, or what Trotsky did. Or Rose, I mean, no offense, right? It's all historically interesting. I'm in a story, and I think we need to learn from this stuff. But I don't think we should be held hostage to it or captive to it, right? What was really interesting, I thought, in John's early initial statement was he cites this um, poll, right, in which Democratic Party members, 57% um, express an interest or, or, or see socialism as attractive, right? Well, that seems to me something we should actually try to learn from. Um, this is a rejection of the past because people are focused on the present and the future. They're tired of being red-baited or, or driven by fear into rejecting these possible options. 
right? They don't want to be held hostage to history. And I think that choice that they make is something that we ought to understand and respect and get behind and not simply try to raise their consciousness by yet another tour of the last hundred years of history, right? And ostensibly what we think we can learn from it. So the only other point I wanted to make here, because it sort of has to do with this question of what is socialism. Uh, I do want to discuss the cognate term communism, right? John, in his original statement, talked about sort of the early distinctions that Marx raised between the socialist transition and the communist outcome. And, you know, for, to make a long story short, the terms have often been used somewhat interchangeably over the 19th and early 20th centuries. It seems to me that the real distinction that matters to us comes in 1918, 1917 and 1918, in the immediate aftermath of the Russian Revolution. And again, as um, David mentioned in his remarks, uh, the Bolsheviks have come into power, and initially they promised that they're going to go through the Constituent Assembly, right? This was sort of the great centerpiece of political reform, as had been envisioned by the Provisional Revolutionary Government. And the elections are held, and lo and behold, the Bolsheviks don't gain the majority. It's the social revolution. It's representing the peasantry that quite predictably gain the majority vote. And so when it comes time for the Constituent Assembly to convene in January of 1918, the Bolsheviks shut it down because they're not winning. And they're all about winning, right? And so they very clearly, at that juncture, choose the principle of class rule over any semblance of political democracy as it was actually presented to them. Two months later, in March, they changed the name of the Bolsheviks to the Communist Party. And shortly after that, as you know, they set up the Communist International, which becomes the axis of affiliation alignment for a new gathering, affiliation of communists right, organizations and individuals from around the world. So at that point, right, these are people who view the previous socialist tradition as discredited, right, largely on basis of World War I and its outcomes. Um, we can get later into the question of whether they betrayed the revolutions of 1918 or not. I think that's largely a red herring that should be put to rest finally, but I digress. Um, the point is, is that people make a choice to reject the old socialist tradition in favor of the new communist future. They consciously affiliate and align with the Soviet model. They do so often in advanced capitalist countries where parliamentary democracy is still an option. This is the choice that people make, right? And I'm prepared to say in this meeting, in this gathering, that the outcomes of that Third International did nobody any good at all. Not in the 20th century, not in the 21st. Again, this is a legacy it seems to me we ought to reject and put beside us. I see nothing favorable or good to learn from. It. And so I would say, in, the, in response to the question, I know, what is socialism? I would say that communism doesn't have much to do with the socialism I want to see or I want to promote or that I see offers any kind of road to the future. That, to me, is the dead hand of the past. Let's draw our poetry from the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I think the rise of Trumpism, uh, Brexit, the rise of the European far right who are coming to power all over, the genocidal attacks on the Syrian revolution by Putin and by Iran. All this is inspiring young people, especially, to reach out for an oppositional concept to this horrific reality. Thus we see the explosive growth of something like Democratic Socialists of America with the multi-tendencies within it. We also see their internal debates over how to respond to what's happening in Syria, which I consider to be the test of world politics, including social democratic politics. Um, we also see other historic trends returning to the scene, as you just stated, Maoism, for example, um, which may not be a positive thing. So let's ask, what is socialism? It happens that this has been the foundational question within Marxism. For Marx, it was a matter of philosophic mediation. When Marx singles out the proletariat as the revolutionary subject in 1843, it is as, as he says, a sphere which has a universal character by its universal suffering and claims no particular right because no particular wrong, but wrong generally is perpetrated against it, which is the complete loss of humanity and hence can win itself only through the 
complete re-winning of humanity. This includes new relations between people as well as between humanity and nature. Uh, this is in his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. Marx soon spells this out as humanism, as the social individual that is the new subject of an appropriated dialectic of freedom. Note that it isn't only the proletariat singled out as the subject of wrong generally, but also woman. Uh, as Marx says, the infinite degradation in which humanity exists for itself has its unambiguous, decisive, plain, and undisguised expression in the relation of man to woman. I think that's still pretty relevant. Marx could have taken up New World slavery and the impact of the American Civil War will inspire his reorganization of Volume 1 of Capital. Uh, I think he didn't do it then because Hegel had already written in his Philosophy of Right that, quote, a slave has an absolute right to free himself. I am entitled to the union of my potential and my actual being. Anti-slavery, and thus anti-racism, is fundamental to the very concept of both the proletariat and Marx's humanism. These relations of philosophy, subjectivity, and objective reality become central to Marx's lifetime of theory and practice right up to his late writings on non-industrial societies and the role of women in history. His own critique of socialism is spelled out in the 1875 critique of the Gotha program of the contemporary German Socialist Party. It means the end of the division between mental and manual labor, nothing less, a completely new form of life. Capital itself, Marx structured very carefully. The freely associated labor that strips away the commodity form in chapter one is inextricable from the absolute general law of accumulation of capital, as well as from the quote, so-called primitive accumulation of slavery and genocide. That inextricability marks capital as a philosophic projection of humanism. It is the absolute embodied in the social being, the absolute dialectic of freedom. This is socialism for Marx. The question arises again very concretely in the early 20th century debates over the nature of imperialism, the collapse of the Socialist International in World War I, um, and, the nature, um, and the dialectics of the Russian Revolution. This dialogue included names as prominent as Lenin, Luxembourg, Trotsky, Bukharin, Kautsky, and Hilferding. In the face of these issues, as well as anti-colonial revolts in Ireland, China, India, the Middle East, and Central Asia, Lenin felt compelled to return to Hegel's dialectic to work out practical positions on imperialism and national liberation because his worldview had collapsed with the collapse of what he thought of as socialism. Um, Lenin realized that, quote, none of the Marxists have understood Marx. To be brief, in the absence of a serious reorganization of thought, the Bolshevik party, Lenin's party, failed to negotiate the 1920s and the development of state capitalism. Some even created a non-Marxist economic category of primitive socialist accumulation of capital, which would have appalled Marx with both its incoherence and potential anti-humanism. The door was open for the world historic disaster of Stalinism, which we still suffer from and the image of socialism still suffers from. What is socialism was raised again in Eastern Europe in the post-World War II era. Then Marxist humanists like Leszek Kolakowski, Karol Kosick, and Egon Bundy made an explicit return to Marx's philosophic writings as opposed to the alienation they experienced living under Russian communist rule and under state capitalism. It was an attempt to reform communism from within, which came to be called socialism with a human face in Czechoslovakia. In Hungary, it saw the participation of the Petofi Circle and George Lukács in the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. Polish thinker Kolakowski pointed out that this version of Marxist humanism was also in tension with narrow nationalism of the sort that holds power in Poland today and builds monuments to Kolakowski. It did represent the search for new human relations among the masses of people. In the 1980s, though, the significant Marxist humanist Mihailo Markovic in Yugoslavia fell into exactly this narrow nationalism in Serbia, a huge philosophic retrogression that laid a groundwork for the Bosnian genocide of the 1990s. 
This retrogression arguably came the basis around which world reaction reorganized itself. We hear its echoes everywhere today in anti-immigrant politics, anti-Islam, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, bigoted versions. In Bosnia, of course, it was outright genocide. Socialism that only amounts to state ownership and planning will be disastrous. It is change that remains within alienation. It's a shuffling of titles, but it's not a fundamental change in human relationships. The founder of Marxist humanism in the US, Raya Dunayevskaya, wrote a 1987 essay on a post-World War II view of Marxist humanism for a Yugoslav encyclopedia of contemporary socialism. She recognized the growth of reaction and counseled the self-development of ideas cannot take second place to the self-bringing forth of liberty by the masses because both the movement from practice that is itself a form of theory and the development of theory as philosophy are more than just saying philosophy is action. There is surely one thing on which we should not try to improve on Marx, and that is trying to have a blueprint for the future. I would argue that the Arab Spring revolts were the most powerful challenge to this current stage of world reaction. How much bigotry was erased when workers in Madison, Wisconsin, in 2011, sought to, as they said, walk like the Egyptians in Tahrir Square? Uh, some of you are old enough to remember the Occupy movements that followed. The Syrian revolution was the turning point, and it occasioned another failure to successfully define what is socialism. Very few leftists of any stripe supported that revolution, even when it was exemplary on any terms, nonviolent and explicitly nonsectarian. Many leftists in Occupy Chicago and elsewhere argued against that internationalism which was inherent in the movement. They argued against walking like an Egyptian at that point. It was a failure to theorize what was arising from the mass movement. It was a failure to see one's own time as theoretical. That leads to a failure of practice. Syrians themselves have called consistently for human solidarity, calling to what Marx called the true community, the human community. He wrote that even the smallest rebellions appeal to that human community. That's why there's a universalism in even a local strike or local rebellion because it appeals to the human community. Um, Syrian, oh yeah, they have called, Syrians have called for this solidarity in the name of freedom, of the enlightenment, of religion, and of socialism. Uh, it is what Franz Fanon termed the untidy affirmation of an absolute. Without this humanist philosophic mediation, I will argue that socialism is fated to remain one more form of human self-alienation. As before, the failure to answer this question, what is socialism, has horrific consequences. Those who suffer these consequences can never be allowed to become an historic elision, a dot, 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 any more than the victims of slavery and genocide who are so poignantly remembered and recognized as absolute in Marx's capital. Um, this seems to me to be the debate within socialist ranks today. Thank you. Um, I think because we're advanced in time, I would actually like to open the floor to a Q&A now. Um, because we started late, we actually gained a speaker. To my surprise. Um, so um, keep, try to keep your, uh, you know, make yourself visible to me. Try to keep your questions or statements where you raise your voice at the end of the sentence uh, short and direct, uh, and try to speak uh, perhaps directly to one or two of the speakers so it's clear who's going to address what. Um, so I think we had a very interesting conversation. I would like to open that to you guys now. Several of the speakers raised the point that the recent kind of surge in, in what we call socialism or even democratic socialism are responses to various negative effects, um, austerity, or like the, the general worsening condition of society. And compared to the uh, kind of 
historical idea of socialism that we have, there seems to be a tendency for openness in Marx and even, I would say, in the Second International, Lenin, Luxembourg, Trotsky, um, for this concept of freedom that's not necessarily a response to negative conditions, but itself a kind of idea that society can, can move past itself. And I would just ask if you guys could comment on the current left's treatment of freedom, um, whether it, it is as open or whether it's much more sort of reactive to the right, let's say, or just the general state of society and how to get past this impasse if, for example, we don't have a, a blueprint for the future, as Fred has mentioned, or if we don't look to the past, as, as uh, John uh, has mentioned. Thank you. Socialism and freedom, any takers? So we'll, we'll uh, collect yes. one question at a time so that the question actually does get addressed to socialism and freedom. That's an interesting question. I. And I only, I, I, I can only observe my very small piece of the action, and I've seen a discernible change in the attitudes of my students, say, over the last 10 years. And I think some of it has to do with the collapse of the American paradigm, that you can simply get what you want through dint of your hard work and labor. 10 years ago, people would say, I am where I am because of the choices I made, right? And as they, as they imagine themselves climbing that, ladder to success. And I think that the essential collapse of that has forced people to confront the collectivity of their predicament and has forced them to get more social in the ways in which they're seeking answers. And um, and I would say, you know, it, it, my, my understanding of so the socialism as popularly expressed today, it has something to do with the Scandinavian model, it has something to do with universal health care, uh, it's very ecumenical, it's not doctrinaire, it's, again, not rooted in any particular historical trajectory. Uh, it just seems to present the possibility of a better future. And, um, and I think that people, what I think is distinctive is, is that, about this is that people are now perhaps capable of seeing that within those social solutions lies actually a greater realm of human freedom. Right? We're being asphyxiated by the current model. Right? It's crushing us. And um, beyond that, I wouldn't venture to say. It gets very complicated because when you talk about the left at this point, I'm not sure what we're talking about. And, and there is certainly a censorious quality that is being discerned as part of sort of, you know, the campaigns on social media. I, it's, 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 I think it's very hazardous to, to, to venture simple generalizations beyond that point. Does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I would want to bring out something that Fred said, which is that um, the, that free associated labor, uh, something Fred said was that free associated labor is inextricably linked to the accumulation of capital. Like capital is like the self-estrangement of free labor. Um, and so, and I think Fred highlighted this kind of self-contradiction of bourgeois freedom that Marx recognized. Um, and so, you know, yeah, possibly some of the demands of like these like petty bourgeois discontents that are taking form at like the national level um, might have some kind of expression of a struggle for freedom at some point in them. Um, the question for me is uh, how, what does that mean for the struggle for socialism? Right, like how do they point beyond themselves? Um, and the, I ended my talk uh, saying, you know, there's no socialist party today. <laughs> um, and so without that, um, it's unclear like, what progress and regress are. It's unclear, um, it's unclear what these discontents mean in a struggle for socialism, if there isn't a struggle for socialism. Um, and I guess, you know, I, I think that there is a tendency um, to do what John said, actually, which is um, uh, to say that what, what would be good, a good outcome of like the 2018 to 2020 uh, political time frame would be to see some modern day Roosevelt kind of policies, like a new New Deal or something. And and I think this is people's conception of what socialism is. Um, and it's kind of it's kind of totally um, it's strange because it's just an, it's like expanding the welfare state, and it's um, and it is like it, it could be opposed to freedom. Certainly, socialists in the nineteenth century were always opposed to state control. The question was, for them, once you have a political party, the question is who's leading it on a social level. Um, 
But yeah, I don't know. Um, the, I don't know if others want to take the question. John, would you like to jump in there? Um, yeah, well, I'm not exactly sure I understand fully your question, but uh, I think some of the, the comments um, that have been made, uh, I agree you know, with uh, the direction of my, I think, um, you know, the, again, I, I kind of go back to that statement of, or that piece of writing that uh, Michelle Alexander had, because I think, can you speak? Yeah, what she, what she expressed is this idea that, um, you know, a lot of what's, you know, motivating people is, is you know, struggle for equality, you know, on, on a very basic level. And, but I would also add, you know, uh, struggle for dignity and a voice, you know, a voice. In, uh, and you can see that even now, you know, in these demonstrations that are taking place, uh, particularly uh, with the uh, sexual assault survivors, you know, uh, who are seeking a voice, you know, and some dignity in this uh, this, uh, you know, horrible um, uh, experiences that they've had. Uh, so, but also what John was saying too, in terms of finding kind of a collective, this collective uh, social, collective uh, way of working. You know, that understanding that that uh, their uh, future and their freedom or whatever. Uh, is not just dependent on themselves, but you know, is dependent on collective action and, and finding community, you know, uh, which I think is a really important uh, thing. And in that sense, it's I think it's 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 based in again this idea that whatever movement's going to develop for a different kind of world is going to be based in in this setting. It's going to be based in this reality, you know, that we're. Um, and all of the things that are affecting it and influencing it, um, uh, you know, including obviously the, the right and you know Trump and this mass fascist base that's potentially being developed, um, but also new forms of communication, social media, and so on. You know, um, I I think just in terms of you know this struggle for uh, you know how this thing is going to unfold. I don't see a single political party. I just don't see that. I don't see a, you know, a, you know, a single communist party or socialist party. I see a very diverse, um, you know, uh, movement for socialism that reflects all kinds of different social forces and political parties. Because I, I think that society is so complex now. There's so many voices that are, you know, uh, coming to the fore. And, and finding ways to work together, you know. So I, I, and I you kind of see the seeds of it now. I mean, but that, that I think, is going to continue to mature and develop. But I, I see this kind of coalition for socialism, you know, or, or a, a much more equitable <coughs> society, call it whatever you want. I, I think, you know, a lot of people have trouble putting a label on it, which I sometimes, I, you know, I agree with that it's, it's problematic just because of the associations people have with socialism in the past and, and so on. So whatever you want to call it, it's going to be a very diverse, uh, multifaceted movement, you know, that's going to kind of uh, bring this thing into being. Would you like to respond to that question? Yeah, just briefly. Um, I think that um, you phrased it really well. I think, you said, I think you phrased it really well. You said it points, you know, beyond itself. Uh, yeah, because one of the great things in Marx is that, that dialectic of freedom always brings up unexpected things. So, like, you know, the, it, Marx writes a letter, and it, this is well known now, but Marx writes a letter to Vera Zasulich, the Russian revolutionary, which, you know, later, and says, you know, maybe a society like Russia doesn't have to go through capitalism. And, of course, then this becomes, you know, something that is only known later and you know, is related to the dialectics of the revolution in Russia post, you know, post uh, whatever that Latin phrase is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but so that's that's kind of well known now. But even something like, um, you know, Marx in the critique of the Gotha program, there's a, he, he writes about, you know, there is no equality between people. And it's often taken as like a negative thing, you know, like, well, Marx is saying that, you know, 
there has to be a, an elite dictatorship or something. That, that's how it was read in the 50s and by you know, anti-communist scholars or anti-Marxist scholars. Um, but think of something like the disability rights movement in those times. People are not equal. People do have special needs, you know, and that those people participate equally in that struggle for freedom. And so just all of these things open up. And, and I doubt Marx himself ever foresaw that. You know, he was doing it as a principle. But this principle has concrete implications, just like the letter to Zasulich came to have very concrete implications when Russia and then a whole revolutionary anti-colonial movement and third world revolutions after World War II. Um, so that is the, you know, that, that's one of the, one of the uh, defining things of, of that dialectic of freedom as it was developed and, and humanist freedom is it points beyond itself and it keeps being open to new things. And you know, it's why you can't draw a blueprint for the future because new things will keep opening up. Um, but the principle is, if you have that principle, you'll see those new things. You know. um, to, um, to John, for Professor at USC, um, and I guess it can also for um, others on the panel, um, the two parts you quoted from the, um, um, the 18th Brumaire, the part of we must get our poetry from the future and we must let the dead bury the dead. Um, you said earlier in, in your speech about how quite possibly we might need to um, drop or there's not anything to learn from the whole history of Marxism. But I guess my question is that um, there's been discussion on the panel about how whatever we want to consider this socialism that we're seeing emerge in the U.S. Mm -hmm. is almost like welfare state or a new type of new deal what's I guess I want to ask if that's the poetry we're getting you know if that's the future from which we're getting our poetry from what's new about it mm -hmm. well, that's a good point um, is that directed to you <laughs> sure <laughs> um, you know it, it's we live in funny times and unprecedented times and in some ways, we are broaching questions, as Fred just mentioned, about disability that, uh, that were sort of un incomprehensible to previous generations. Um, you know, within, um, I mean, in, in my community, there's, there's prevailing debates over education. Education reform, <laughs> the concept of equity has become central. Right, which sort of I think res represent an advance over previous discourse on on these kinds of issues. Um, there is a sort of richness, I think, to the ecumenical culture of the left and the kinds of debates that it is taking on, the kind of questions it's considering, that's not wholly exhausted by the public option, right, or right, or or one or another welfare state provision. And I'm not sure that. The sort of this nascent ecumenical socialist notion of today is particularly well expressed as welfare statism. I, I, I don't think that people are, you know, going back and reinvigorating Hubert Humphrey as a role model. Right? I mean, I mean, it's not. That's just not the culture uh, or the historical references that that people are pointing to. I think what's really interesting about today, and again, I mean, we're talking about the United States, which is sort of a, a, a peculiar political culture and, and not necessarily representative of the most advanced thinking across the world. But the one thing that's really cool in this moment, and the other thing that I think is, is wonderful about this growing realism in respect to socialism is that it represents the end up to American exceptionalism which I think is a huge ideological factor in American affairs, has always been, right, has reared its head in many sort of very conspicuous and ugly ways, in, 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 including in the recent past. And I think it, re it reflects within American culture a, a new willingness to sort of acknowledge that we have something to learn from other people's experience. So. I'm not making any profound claims that, you know, that, that, that we're on the verge of the New Jerusalem here. Uh, but I, I do think um, there is a richness, a vitality, and a reality to the current debates that are not 
contained or are are, 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 are are comprehensible through the old categories of Marxist thought, right? I mean, I I I know you're fighting the good fight and sort of expanding that that language and that approach, uh, but I but it's in that spirit that yeah I think. We are confronted with questions that Marx could never have imagined, right? We're talking about the role of globalization and undermining the sovereign state, right? Which is creating all these tensions in respect to Brexit or Trumpism and the like. I mean, Marx always took for granted that the economies he, would, he was talking about would unfold within a kind of nation state arrangement, right? We are now confronted with pressing political issues that were not part of that history of that previous reality. And so, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to my own theoretical perspectives, I mean, I, I feel I've learned something about Marx. I'm not anti-Marxist. I kind of feel that the, the more appropriate thing is to be post-Marxist. It's time to move on. But I'm also Habermasian. I'm also, I, you know, I look at other different <coughs> theoretical par paradigms as, my, try, as I try and understand the dynamics of social change. Um, I think we need to be more eclectic, more inclusive, and, and, and more willing to learn from the contributions of the last 50, 60 years and so far as social theory, social thought is concerned. So that's the best I can do. But it's a good question, and you're, you, you, you cut me dead to rights, right? Good. Can I also respond to the question? Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting, uh, right, because the, the teacher, like the, the poetry of the 1848 revolution also occurred on the with the image of the bourgeois revolution, but you know what else could have possibly been the case? Um, and you know it happened again in 1871, uh, where the the vision for uh, the Paris Commune was on the basis of the bourgeois revolution and bourgeois society. And so um, the problem really is that the society we live in is uh, undermines itself at the same time that it necessitates us to try and reconstitute it. So if all these social movements that we're building that are new and sexy and cool, um, if they're going to like reproduce the same problem again, um, and already reproducing the same problem again by not building uh, a party for socialism, not pointing beyond themselves in terms of being able to recognize their own internal self-contradictions, um, but instead are just giving support to a petty bourgeois democratic party, um, then you know, does that mean that we still, like, maybe that might be a reason why Marx might be relevant. Or if it's not, and it's just like uh, uh, like a long, you know, slow evolution towards like equality, then maybe Marx isn't relevant. Uh, and you know, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, but that seems to be like what's that seems like. I don't think you could have it both ways. Like I don't think you could envision that we could slowly work towards um, like uh, you know universal equality and socialism um, and ditch Marx or something. <laughs> Um, it's kind of like, at this point, after uh, the 1848 revolutions and after we've seen these like long history of bourgeois democratic revolutions on the basis, like on this basis, like go into crisis um, over and over and over again. Um, it's kind of like, I don't know, I don't, I don't see how you could just like uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater. That makes sense. But. More questions? I have a question. Um, I know you, sir. You mentioned a uh, how uh, we're in these times. There are some. There are a lot of people with a lot of voices, and you, I know you mentioned a, a, a diverse coalition of groups, if I recall correctly. Um, how was it, that kind of brings up a question, or something that I've seen among about the left is a uh, level sectarianism, with different groups uh, say, not wanting to work with others because oh, their theory is, is not work right for us, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I would just like you, uh, um, if um, any, any of all, or if, all, if anything, all of your opinion on the level of sectarianism and how that affects the left, and maybe how can we go beyond that? Because uh, from what I've heard and read regarding the unity of the right, uh, from what I think of Steve Bannon, who he's met with, I think if I remember correctly, uh, Marine Le Pen in mm -hmm. France, and he's also lent his aid uh, to some of the right wingers in Brazil who are currently running for office. And um, I mean that's kind of a dangerous notion—the idea that the right is becoming more international, as of where the left should be. And I was just wondering what you guys' opinion on that is. John, do you want to jump on that? Yeah. Um, well, it's a it's a good question. I think it goes back to this point of how you define the left. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think in 
you know, today's society anyway, I, I have a very broad understanding of what the left is, and it's not confined to small groups or whatever uh, parties, but, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, left sentiment or left movement around issues, you know, whether it be uh, Medicare for all or, uh, you know, uh, some other uh, issue. So I think kind of have to have a much more expansive view, you know, of what, what we consider to be the left. I, to me, the, the most important thing is, is how you go about building very broad alliances, you know, and political alliances. And um, I think that, you know, one can't be restricted even by the venue. So, for example, um, uh, you know, there's, fortunately, there's, there's uh, some groups that won't work you know, with the Democratic Party, it won't work in the Democratic Party, even though, for example, the labor movements in the Democratic Party or, uh, you know, uh, the environmental movement, but not, you know, is, is working, um, or DSA even, you know, working within the Democratic Party. So um, I think this idea of very broad alliances uh, with major social forces, that's, that's to me the way we have to work. Is how to build these, you know, you know, with the working class and labor movement at the at the center, if possible, but very broad alliances, political alliances, both on, on different issues, but also an electoral alliance too, as well, to advance, um, you know, a, a kind of a pro pro people agenda. Now, the way I look at it is that, you know, this movement's got to go through different stages, you know, and. You know, there's, depending on what are the, kind of the major uh, battles being fought at any one time. And today, in my my view, the major battle that we're confronted with is defeating the extreme right. Again, ousting them from power. Uh, so that requires an extremely broad coalition of forces, including working with, as I said, you know, the Democratic Party and working even with sections of capital, you know, who, who have broken with the right uh, um, for whatever reasons, you know, it doesn't really matter to me, but the fact is, is that you can, these alliances have to incorporate them as well. They're momentary, but they get us through the moment and, and open up the door to new stages of struggle. So very broad alliances, that's the way I kind of look at politics. Frick, why can the left get along? <laughs> um, well, sometimes they do, and that can be a problem too. <laughs> the uh, yeah, there's there's a there's a pattern. I mean, if you if you're around the left for a long time, I mean, it's like you know there are times when you're exactly right. There's a intense sectarianism, and you know uh, there'll be whispering campaigns. You know that guy over there is crazy, man. He's out of his mind. You know, usually it's me. <laughs> but you know, there's other times when, like, like uh, in the organizing against the war in Iraq, you know, the, the entire left would be in one room, and you know, everybody will be in a, in a basic agreement: we're all anti-war, we're all opposed to this war. But part of, but part of the upshot of that then will be, well, but we can't use the, a word like imperialism in our slogans, even though 90 percent of the people in this room have a position on imperialism. Can't use that, because that will alienate people. Well, I'm not sure who, who it will alienate, you know, because it's not tried. How do you know it will alienate people? You know, and Republicans, you know, pro-war people. So, so, you know, the, the unity of the left can be a problem, too, when it doesn't express real principle. And I think that, so I, I think that, uh, you know, and, and, and that, that just raises so many issues. I mean, like, you know, the, the, the kind of ingrown nature. Like, what happens when the left gains a little power? What does it do? Well, it polices the left. You know? it's, this is not a positive development. So I think this is why the left can't, you know, get along, because there's not <coughs> a solid basis in principle. And, and there's a, it, it's more like, you know, if you go to something like the left forum, you know, I, I used to put up trade shows in McCormick Place. You know, I recognize a trade show when I see them. You know, um, it's not like you know B movies or something. It's you know left groups. So, 
you know, there's. The, I think that the, the left has to be. The, the left has to be critiqued, in its in itself. And I mean, and this is not self-exculpatory. I mean, everyone has to do this. You know, this is part of developing principle. Is also, as as Lenin said, admitting mistakes. You know, this is the the most important thing a revolutionary can do is admit when he or she is wrong. You know, if you if you can't do that, and you know, I I encourage people to watch. You know. The, the, the well-known figures of the left and see how many ever admit that they've made a mistake. You, know? um, you may be surprised how few because it's just not something that's really been internalized um, to any degree. So, I don't know, those are just random thoughts. Actually. I feel like I responded to the question. Well, it, it's interesting to pose it at this moment because it seems as though like a lot of the sectarian groups um, that you would expect to be offering some kind of radical alternative to the Democratic Party are actually telling you to go and support the Democratic Party. Um, and so, like, uh, the CPUSA, the ISO, um, various others, uh, like, will tell you to go do so. Um, but, you know, I, it's not as if, like, I'm proffering, like, an alternative myself. Like, Platypus is just here to, like, ask the questions. Um, this, the death of the left, we say, long with the left. Um, <laughs> And we say that because, you know, uh, yeah, it's clear that, that the left has been dead for a long time. And it's interesting that the 30s keeps coming back up because, um, you know, in the labor movement being in the Democratic Party since then, you know, sectarians have always, re always revolved around the Democratic Party since then. Um, and, you know, in some ways it's, it seems related to the failure of the revolution to become international, um, the retreat uh, into the national context. Um, but all of those kind of principled stances, which were at some point you were looking at, you know, it's like Lennon says in uh, Letters to a Publicist, um, when you're climbing a mountain, sometimes you have to come down uh, and look, and look, you know, and reposition yourself. Uh, you can't just go in a straight line all the way to the top. Um, so, like, those kind of principled, like, maneuvers have just kind of all been eroded in this long history of, it's like a wreck of defeats. Um, and so I'm not proffering like, that we could take up any of these slogans, even from the 19th century, and like, go out and be like, this is what we have to do right now. Um, but rather I'm saying like, this poses some really important questions about how we're going to even create the possibility for a, a reconstitution of the left. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to clarify. So, so we have 18 minutes more in this room. I saw Franklin uh, had his hand up. I'm going to put myself in the stack. Uh, Patrick, so make yourself visible sure. to me. Um, uh, Franklin, uh, so let's try to keep our responses short so we can get in as much as possible in the next 17 minutes or 18 minutes. Okay, I'd like to particularly address the first and last speakers uh, with the question of how does the effort to revive socialism as an idea confront the damage done by the Thatcherite idea that there is no alternative to capitalism. And I see it, I think, in um, a lot of the people who are being attracted to socialism today, especially those who are running for office, but not only them, um, because it does often uh, sort of uh, reduce to um, a revival of the New Deal or something like that. I've seen the New Deal as a big reference point. Um, and uh, the first speaker had mentioned, you know, like the, all the millions of jobs that would be created with a green economy, um, the need for a guaranteed wage. Are jobs, employment, and wage labor part of socialism? You know, are we looking for a totally different some, uh, uh, society that, that rejects uh, capitalism, capitalist relations, and uh, is founded on this idea of freely associated labor instead? Um, and, and therefore, is there a meaningfulness to socialism that does not define itself as revolutionary, does not define itself in relationship to revolution, uh, social revolution? Um, and, and there, okay, the, the self-activity of workers as opposed to being uh, revolving around like uh, democratic control of the economy or something, nationalization and, and planning. And, um, and I was particularly wanted to ask Fred how we could relate this to his statement that um, something about socialism that without philosophic mediation becomes another form of self-alienation. 
Do you want to jump to that immediately, and then John responds to the first part of the question? Um, okay, sure. I mean, yeah, the the, the I, I, I'm just going to be real brief with that because I I think again it relates to the structure of capital, and I think it's important to really see that Marx's categories are not economic, although you know you can learn something from them about economics. They're not sociology, although you can get some insights from sociology. They're philosophic interventions. Um, and so that, that category of freely associated labor is really the key thing. There is no socialism without the self-activity of the worker. Um, what would happen with any of these things where, where socialism remains rooted in basically um, some version of capitalism with its wages, with its economic categories, you are still subject to that absolute general law of accumulation of capital and that continuing crisis. And I think, you know, far from bowing to Thatcher's there is no alternative, Marx was the one presenting there is no alternative. Within capitalism, there is no alternative to these continuing crises in which the absolute general law of capitalism leads to a collapse, and then that collapse returns to the so-called primitive accumulation, which is slavery and genocide. And it's no coincidence that we see that again and again and again. You know, and that's just the question, why did we see genocide in the most advanced, economically advanced European nations in the 1930s? Because there is no alternative under capitalism. You know? um, I don't know, that's, that's my thoughts on that. John, the first was very close to you. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand quite your question, but um, I think just in terms of the response to like Thatcherism and whatnot, I think the the argument for socialism comes out of the argument that out of necessity we're con we're confronted with problems today, and out of necessity we have to move in a different kind of direction, and I think that. That's the argument I was trying to make earlier, you know, especially around climate change and wealth inequality and whatnot. The, you know, Republican Party, even the Democratic Party leadership to a certain extent, but mainly the Republican Party, they have no solutions to anything. They're bankrupt. And I think a lot of, you know, capitalist ideolo ideologues are really kind of bankrupt in terms of their ideology and their outlook and addressing a lot of these problems. They don't work. You know, Rahm Emanuel and whatnot, their policies don't work. You know, they just continue to create deeper crises. When when the Sanders campaign, um, you know, exploded on the scene, I mean, there was mass excitement around that campaign because his proposals, you know, really expanded the universe. They expanded people's thinking about what was possible, what could, what kinds of solutions could be, uh, you know. Employed, you know, to solve some basic problems. So it seems, just seems to me that when you start talking about necessity and <coughs> really addressing these things in a fundamentally different way, that's where people really respond. And that's uh, what I think will we'll get over that, address that issue. Uh, so my question has to do with uh, what, what came up in terms of uh, the plurality of politics present um, and sort of uh, what role a movement for socialism would have within that. So if, um, you know, like I got this impression that um, that our sort of uh, understanding of the present is that, is that there's these different struggles for economic justice, for, uh, you know, sustainability, for gender equality, for all of these different things, and then there's also a struggle for socialism. At the same time, it seems that, like, what the struggle for socialism means just means supporting these other movements. These, you know, what the, struggle, what the struggle for socialism means, or the way that it's been presented, is that the struggle for socialism is a struggle for economic justice, for gender equality, for sustainability, and all of these other things. So my question is, you know, if these are movements that are already happening that exist outside of socialism, what then is the point of having a socialist movement in the present? What role does this? Why? Why have a socialist? Movement? If there's already a movement for economic justice, if there's already a movement for climate, you know, to address climate change, for gender inequality, you know, what is, what is the, um, what, what, what would a socialism, a movement for socialism, uh, 
with you. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start by speaking with the Sanders campaign of 2016, which I mainly liked you know, and, and, and supported. And what I thought was very interesting about what Bernie did was that he spoke to all these issues. He spoke to police brutality. He spoke to gender equality. Right? He spoke to various forms of discrimination. But he never let the discussion remain on that. He always brought it back to economic inequality and his you know, very broad sort of socialist proposals, right, for reforms to, in, to minimize inequality and the like, which Hillary didn't do. Hillary let and, and Hillary was pilloried as someone who was exploiting identity politics for political gain. And she let it happen because she really had no answer as to the economic issues. And she had no social vision other than neoliberalism. And so I don't think in, in answer, how I would answer your question is I don't think socialism is just simply another cause to add on to the others. But I think what was laudable about Sanders' campaign was that he made it the pivot, the starting point, and the end point of a more general, broad critique, right, and notion of the many fronts upon which social reform must be fought for. Does that, does that make sense? But that seems to have vanished. So if we think back to early 2016, that question, of, so the Iowa caucus poll uh, was the first one to have registered sort of a plurality of Democratic voters. Uh, speaking out in favor of socialism. I don't think that seems to be much on the agenda in 2018. The 2018 election can be taken to be more as a referendum on Trump and the experience of the sure. past two years. Sure. So um, maybe to, to put the question again to, uh, to, to uh, John Bachtel. Um, so as a chairman of the Communist Party, as someone interested in Marx, um, in that larger context of struggle and this diverse coalition, how does the Communist Party sort of take out uh, make its case for socialism? Uh, yeah, well, I think the, the fundamental issue is uh, power. You know, is the working class uh, both lead, you know, asserting the, the role of the working class in leading this whole thing um, and its allies and, and building a very broad uh, alliance, you know, with other forces, but also ultimately being the, you know, the the class that's going to be in political power in this country, um, and that's—I think—that's a different kind of concept. It's not just having, you know, capitalism and, and the capitalist class still run things, and then kind of take make some efforts around economic justice and, and so on. It's actually replacing them as, you know, uh, in terms of political power, and then beginning to change the, the economic relations of the country. As a whole, so it's a, it's a, but it's, so I, I think it seems to me that the socialist movement has to kind of make that clear, you know, and um, has to has to fight for more long term aims, you know, of social transformation in this country and kind of give a vision, you know, for that. Um, and I, I I think if you're for most most organizations and movements are kind of siloed in a lot of ways, so we need kind of a comprehensive vision, you know, of what what we want to see, and so that's to me that's kind of the aim of it, and it's also kind of in the end also helping to elaborate the strategy and how to get there. You know, it's, it's it, because there is there are tactics and strategies and how to unfold this whole thing. So, uh, and that that's kind of where I guess we kind of see our role. You know, is helping to develop that strategy, not only in terms of unity of all these different social forces, but the different stages and so on that they go through to get there. Shall we take one more question and then uh, perhaps the speakers could use it as a way of wrapping up their own, uh, or, or as a basis for concluding remarks. Um, so do we have uh, one more? Ed? <laughs> well, I, I can wait, so this might have been addressed, but um, I, I guess I'm like, just off of where the conversation has just been, I'm curious um, if you think about the approach you just articulated um, with respect to building kind of a working class power and um, maybe giving a vision of unity to some of these disparate movements um, and kind of that being the task of socialists, right? Thinking about the relation to capitalist parties and capitalist politics, I'm wondering under what conditions would you pursue that 
in and around the Republican Party? Like if the Republican Party is becoming increasingly the party of certain factions of organized labor, or is branding itself as a working class party in the way that the Democrats historically have? <coughs> like how do you decide which capitalist party to build in and around like that, that socialist vision? I, I, I take this to be the question that seems to be very directly addressed almost to John, but um, so I'm thinking like how the other speakers could could take it as a so, uh, but to wrap it up in, in terms of the context of our conversation on socialism, so perhaps I think an under, to broaden the question is, it was raised in the initial remarks by Fred and, and, and David, uh, the question of labor right, and, 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 and labor politics, and that's sort of dissipated. It's not entirely clear to me that the labor movement is in the Democratic Party, because the majority of private sector union workers voted for, uh, for, for Donald Trump. So um, I guess perhaps you can certainly address this part of this question, but also sort of address uh, the connection between socialism and labor politics um, for those who didn't have anything particularly to say about republicanism. Shall we go from, from uh, John to Fred again? Yeah. Um, well, just on that, just on the Republican Party, I kind of see a, a different track. I see, I see the political realignment taking place with respect to the Republican Party. And I, I actually think that there are in a, in a state of crisis, and what's going to emerge is not clear, but I, I think for sure you have a, the potential for having a mass fascist base there. You know, just this, well, there's a lot of factors there that are really dangerous, I think, and it's going to be with us for a long time. And um, But I think that we're, we'll probably go through different stages, so eventually a, a mass uh, kind of people's party is going to emerge in this country that will split off from the Democratic Party um, that will be led by you know, labor and all these other different social forces uh, at its core. Um, so I, but it, it, it's going to go through these different stages, but again, it, it, it depends on what are the, the main kind of pl uh, political uh, urgent tasks of the moment. And, and right now, all these different forces are Banded together because they want to block and stop, you know, the extreme right and, and elect people that will help to reverse a lot of the policies. So once that, once we kind of get over that hump, I think this one you can see, you know, the emergence of a new political realignment, including down the road, as I said, some kind of mass people's party that will more and more take on the character of a mass socialist party. Um, so. I actually want to reference back to something Patrick raised, which is like, it seems like there's this commingling of uh, demands, um, and some of those demands seem to be coming out of, you didn't say this, but I'm adding this, uh, seem to be coming out of the 1960s, or uh, the 1930s, um, but then there's this older demand, the demand for socialism, which comes out of uh, the peak and crisis of the bourgeois revolutions in the 19th century, um, and they just seem to be commingling, but, um, it seems as though like the present, uh, the way that present leaders and parties identify with the term socialism um, is to rebrand um, existing strategies. So what, what I would characterize as like the, the same urban ethnic constituency strategy that the Democrats have used since the 30s and earlier. Um, and so I think it's just a rebrand. Um, but this possibly, uh, poses interesting questions that we should consider about the relationship of the bourgeois revolution to socialism, the relationship of uh, the bourgeois revolution to capitalism, and the relationship of capitalism to socialism. Um, I, you know, I think that the workers' movement in the 19th century, over and against itself, um, was actually building the Industrial Revolution in its demands for uh, labor and for, uh, and for their rights. Um, and in doing so, they were actually proletarianizing themselves. Um, and I think this is this kind of critical like uh, self-consciousness of their self-contradiction, potentially critical self-consciousness of their self-contradiction, posed the necessity for um, the possibility for something that pointed beyond itself. Um, you know, and I think the pre-Marxian forms of socialism more or less um, stoked the Industrial Revolution and 
1848 came to a head in, in a crisis and under, you know, undermined themselves, and so we all know how that went. <laughs> um, but I, I, I wonder um, if, uh, you know, the reason why this question of socialism continues to come back is if we still live in capitalism at all. Or, um, and uh, yeah, I would conclude this quote, like my, my remarks on the question of Buddhist socialism with that question. Um, because maybe if, if all that people can consider is like, uh, you know, um, redistributing wealth uh, on one hand, and then um, with Trump's offering, which is like really slowly working through some like badly organized trade policies. Um, on the other hand, like with some law and order like policies um, that are quite distasteful, um, like that's. I don't know, that's like a really uh, stunted imagination for what's possible, whereas in Marxist time, capitalism was the revolution. Um, so, where are we at? John, where are we at? <laughs> well, it's an interesting question, and I would say that um, I don't care how many workers line up behind the Republican Party, if they're fascist, they gotta be opposed, and the main social base for Le Pen's movement are people who labor, members of French labor who formerly supported the CP. Same thing holds for Italy. I mean, this is sort of a trend that we can observe around the world. And I think what is being called into crisis, amongst other things, is the idealization of a univocal, single proletariat act, proletarian actor, which has been at the center of so much left theorizing for the last 150 years. And we may as well go back to 1848, and Marx posits the proletariat as the answer to the failed bourgeois revolution, as the working out of a dialectical philosophical process. And there's virtually zip sociological observation as to the actual proletariat or the art as a native Paris and this question, there are actual circumstances of life and why it is that they actually might recommend themselves to this vaunted world historical task. And I think part of the unstated story in this room is that the proletariat hasn't acted like the proletariat as the left has predicted all, over these years and it's not acting like the proletariat that we want so badly to see as our instrument of human emancipation and we have to acknowledge that. And I'm, look, I spent 12 years working in the auto plants. I mean, I'm, I'm not anti-labor, right? I've also seen labor take it on the chin. And I, and I can sort of empathize or sympathize with some of the impulses that drive Trumpism, right? The idea of restoring some semblance of national sovereignty to our labor markets and to, right, our, our, the, the, the leverage that our trade unions have within a national economic setting. I mean, it's understandable, which doesn't mean that it's to be exonerated or, or in any way capitulated to, right? But I, I, I think, I, no, I, I mean, I guess, the, I, actually I think this is sort of a usual ending point because you articulated a question that really hasn't been discussed here, where people have been talking about the proletariat as though it's a single actor with a single character or personality, and again, because we have assigned it or Marx has assigned it this role for human emancipation, so it must be. And so it is that when we review the history of the left over the last 150 years, it's a story of betrayal. It's a story of, of leaders who weren't Lenin, who betrayed the proletariat, which was always revolutionary and always wanted revolution, but it was just the damn leaders who betrayed them and prevented it from happening. Right? And again, it's a bogus history. It doesn't stand up in historical terms. Um, right? And it's a false understanding of social dynamics and I think it leaves us badly, serves us badly as we try to understand the present and the future. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I saw the beginnings of Trumpism. I think I was in there at the start because I grew up in Market Park in Chicago and people know the history of that. Um, you know, the Nazis marching there in the 70s. I was a working class neighborhood. That was the proletariat. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, backing up those Nazis. Um, and I think that uh, one should look at a very concrete example of probably the most uh, significant socialist intervention in American politics in my lifetime. And that was Dr. Martin Luther King. And he, when he marched into Marquette Park, in the 1960s and was hit with a brick and was vilified and saw the Nazi slogans and the white power t-shirts. He said, this is worse hatred than I ever saw in the South. And it really made him fall back on his, his thinking. And he 
He said, what does this mean? And read some of the speeches that he gave at that time, which are directly philosophical. They, you know, he talks about the ontology of, of racism. And he says, the, he sums it up in a phrase, one of the great phrases that was ever uttered, the ultimate logic of racism is genocide. And what does he do with that? He organizes the multi-ethnic poor people's march on Washington. One of the, as, as a, really, a, 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 a so, not only a socialist, but even a Marxian, Hegelian socialist response to that logic. He's fighting that logic of racism that was inherent in the fabric of American society that he saw. And he's saying, how do, you, how do you fight this? Well, you bring together the lowest and deepest layers of the proletariat, black, white, Latino, Native American, Asian, bring them all together and make demands on the governments for a different kind of society. That was what, I mean, of course, that's the point that he's killed. I suppose coincidentally, I don't know. Because um, sometimes when you do a fantastic thing like that, just dark forces arise from the underworld against it. But um, I think this was really one of the most consequential socialist interventions that's ever happened in the history of this country. And it's not treated as such because it doesn't speak the, the, the language of socialism. It's like a social hieroglyphic that just sits mm -hmm. there in the history books. And you need that, that philosophic key unlocks it. So go back and read the speeches of Dr. King and the, the philosophic framework that he, he put on that working class movement. Um, that to me is really more of a model than the Roosevelt era or you know any of the other um, any of the other things that are usually pointed to you know because it does transcend the the racial divisions among the proletariat which are deadly and which really cannot be um, can't be uh, bypassed over because a large part of trumpism a large part of Bannonism, you know, which, which he's promoting in Europe and other countries, is really based on that idea that the proletariat can be co-opted by their own prejudices for this kind of neo-fascist project. And we're, we have to, we're fighting that, you know. And there are examples, there are concrete examples in history of how that can be fought. And I think we have to look at them. And I think we have to develop our own thinking and our principles so that we can see what is happening and come up with new creative things as Dr. King did, creative interventions like that. Because otherwise, we're dead, frankly. That's it. I mean, I, you know, it's not the death of the left, but you know, humanity is dead. There's socialism or barbarism. That, that's the, you know, Rosa Luxemburg's uh, fr framework. And, uh, you know, it's more than ever clear today with, with all, all the, with you know genocide becoming almost a casual thing in so many places in Syria, in Yemen, among the Rohingya, etc., in Congo, uh, with global warming, you know, and and the denialism that is going on with it. Even as you you know your allergies get worse and the summers get hotter and the water, the hurricanes get more powerful and more of our cities get inundated. Um, you know we have to develop those thoughts, those principles that can come up with really creative things to this, because all the cliches are on the enemy's side. Every cliche of thought, every cliche of language, every social form that is thoughtlessly carried through, um, you know, all the authoritarianism of the workplace, etc., they're all on the side of the enemy, and all we have is each other. All we have is what is human, which happens to be an absolute contradiction to all those things.